Grace, mercy, and peace be unto each one of you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Savior Jesus Christ who willingly went to the cross for each one of us. In his name, amen. The text for us to ponder as we begin a new Lenten series and a new preaching series uh, comes from the Gospel of Matthew, a portion of chapter 27. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. Well, what shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Thus declares the Word of God. I want to tell you about an incident that took place not too long ago. It took place on an elevator. There were eight people in this elevator who were on their way down from the 20th floor of a building in downtown Chicago. The people did not know each other. They probably had never seen each other before. I doubt they had very much in common. There was an African-American lady in a nurse's uniform, an elderly Asian couple, a man in a lab coat, and various others. They were just strangers living separate lives who happened to be in the same elevator together until the elevator stopped. At that point, they stopped being a collection of strangers, and they became a crowd. A crowd is defined as a collection of people who share at least one significant trait, like cheering for the same football team or liking the, the same rock band. Well, the trait this small crowd shared that day was that they were all stuck in the same elevator. Now, that may not be much of an enviable trait, but it was a shared trait nevertheless. So the group went from a collection of strangers to a crowd. And their forced bonding did not stop there. After about 30 anxious seconds, a guy in the back said, What in the world is going on? And the lady responded, I don't know, but they better hurry and fix this. And then the murmuring and grumbling began in earnest. Yeah, what's their problem? Why are they taking so long? Don't they know that we're in here? And then the panic began. Tempers began to rise. Faces were getting red. Even that sweet elderly couple had scowls on their faces now. One guy actually curled up in the corner on the floor of the elevator in a fetal position. And the nurse then began pounding on the door. Hey, we're in here! And soon everyone was shouting the same sort of thing. Now at that point, they stopped being a crowd and started being a mob. A mob is defined as a crowd that is overrun with emotion and which is capable of doing things that none of the individuals would do under cooler or normal circumstances. So if that were a normal elevator ride, no one would have shouted or pounded on the door or curled up on the floor in the corner. None of those things would have been very well received on a normal elevator ride. But this was no longer a normal elevator ride and the group continued to shout and pound and panic almost in unison, until a minute or two later when the elevator finally kicked back in and took the group down to the first floor where everyone got off and breathed a sigh of relief and became strangers to each other once again with nothing in common except perhaps a shared fear of elevators. The behavior of human groups is really a fascinating study. 
After I finally figured out that God maybe had other plans for me than being a nuclear engineer, I ended up with a secondary education teaching degree with a sociology major. Now, sociology is the study of how humans interact with each other. And one of the things I learned in sociology, sociology is that groups of people can take on a life of their own and do things that the individuals of that group would never choose to do on their own if it were not for the group. This phenomenon is called groupthink, which is defined as a psychological event that occurs within a group of people in which the desire for harmony or conformity in the group results in an incorrect or deviant decision-making outcome. Groups of people can have an incredible influence over those that are within the group. And I think we can see some examples of this sort of influence in the events of Holy Week. Now, there are two main times in Holy Week when groups of people gather. The first was on Palm Sunday. The group that gathered on that road entering Jerusalem truly was a crowd. The trait that bound them together was their enthusiasm for the arrival of Jesus Christ. Their excitement was high, and they were all thrilled that this amazing miracle worker and teacher was coming to their city. For word was going around that Jesus might even be the Messiah. And if that were true, then most of the people believed that Jesus would take his place as the rightful king of Israel, and Rome would be vanquished, and the nation of Israel would be restored. So as people began waving palm branches and shouting as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, I'm sure that the, the, the crowd that started kept growing larger and larger and larger as the events went on. I mean, when you see a crowd of people standing around and looking at something, doesn't your curiosity make you want to go over and see what they're looking at? I'm sure that sort of thing happened on Palm Sunday, and that crowd would have grown steadily, and more and more people would have been drawn in and would have also begun to shout their praises to Jesus and even throw down their cloaks before him as a sort of red carpet treatment. In this case, groupthink would have led the crowd of people to praise Jesus as the coming king. But that leads us to the other gathering of people during Holy Week, the one that took place early on a Friday morning outside Pilate's house in that place known as the Praetorium. The crowd that praised Jesus on that Palm Sunday all week long saw him teaching in the temple courtyard, again and again heard him challenge their own religious teachers. But now they had also seen him arrested and beaten. None of this was what they were expecting. They wanted the Palm Sunday Jesus back, triumphant, exalted, and entering the city like a conquering hero. But quite honestly, they had no use for the Good Friday Jesus, bloody, beaten, humble, humiliated. They were confused then, angry, disappointed, and emotional. They were very prone then to the dynamics of groupthink, and they were capable of doing things that day that individually none of them would have done, like calling for the crucifixion and death of a totally innocent man, a man who had done nothing wrong at all. You see, the crowd that day quickly turned into a mob as they were stirred on by the religious leaders of Israel, men who were jealous of the growing popularity of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and who were felt threatened by him. So when Pilate offered the crowd that first Good Friday a choice about which prisoner should be released, just like he had done for many Passovers before this, well, those religious leaders were the first to yell for Jesus to be crucified and Barabbas to be released. And they encouraged all the other people in the crowd to also yell for Jesus to be crucified. Now, normally, the choice would have been pretty obvious. Should they release a mass murderer or a man who had done nothing wrong except irritate the religious leaders? Now, normally, it's a pretty easy choice. Keep the mass murderer locked up, put him to death, let the other guy go. But because of group dynamics and the influence of the religious leaders, well, the crowd of individuals that day yelled out, Crucify him! Crucify him! about Jesus and demanded that Barabbas be let go. 
Once the religious leaders started yelling, crucify him themselves, well, that chant ended up being picked up by more and more and more of the group until our text tells us all of them were asking Pilate to put Jesus to death, even though he had done nothing wrong at all. The influence of the crowd led people to do things that they never would have done on their own, including demanding that an innocent man be wrongly put to death on a cross. And today as we think about this, we ask the question. It's a question being asked of you. It's a question being asked of me. Were you there in that shouting crowd? Now think about that. Are you any different than the people in that crowd that first Good Friday? Now before you answer, I want you to think to yourself if there have ever been times when perhaps you have been influenced by the crowd around you, by the people around you. It's interesting, most people who start smoking do not start smoking because all of a sudden they woke up with a tremendous desire to light up cancer-causing agents and then inhale them. I've never known anyone who started smoking for that reason. No, most people start smoking because of the influence of others, because some of the people around them, people they liked, people they admired, smoked, and groupthink affected them. Likewise, most people who started drinking alcohol or using drugs did so because of the influence of others. Maybe their best friends or all the cool people at school were using them. Many people decide to have sex before marriage because they're told that everyone's doing it, groupthink. Even though that's never the case, and as your mom would tell you, so what? If everyone was jumping off a cliff, would you have to jump off the cliff too? So think about that and realize that's just the starting point. For there's almost an infinite number of ways that we allow others, the crowd, the mob, the world, our friends, to decide what we are going to do or say or think or where. For example, I was growing up as a teenager in the 1970s. How long do you think my hair was in the 1970s? Yeah, Rodney's, what, what Rodney's used to be was about where mine was. Why? Well, of course, I look good like that. There is no doubt about that. Rodney did too, yeah. But it may have been because everybody else had to have had long hair, and that was my way of rebelling and being different by being like everyone else, groupthink. Or when the disco era started, you know, why was it I was wearing those leisure suits with those silk shirts that were unbuttoned down to the middle of my chest? And of course, part of the reason is, is because the two hairs on my chest looked really good sticking out of that leisure suit. But that's only part of the reason. The main reason is because everyone was doing it, and I wanted to fit in. Now, those are silly examples. But you know what? Groupthink affects us in so many ways. My dad worked at a factory. I once, uh, he picked me up from school after a basketball practice or something, and he had another guy from the factory that he was giving a ride to. That was the first time I'd ever seen him around one of his other factory workers. I sat in the back seat of my car, stunned. Why? because my dad and his factory buddy talked the way the people did at the factory, which for some of you who have been in the Navy was like the people in the Navy talked to each other on the ship. Now, they knew that was wrong. They knew their moms would wash out their mouths with soap if they talked like that in front of their moms. But groupthink, the influence of the crowd, didn't matter what they were taught growing up at that point. The influence of the crowd leads people to do things that they would never do on their own except for the crowd. And you know what? That's even true of our spiritual beliefs and practices. One of the realities of the church today is that the vast majority of even church-belonging Christians don't go to church every Sunday. 
And I'm not talking about those who are sick or ill or have to work on Sundays. I'm talking about everybody else. Why don't they go to church on Sundays? Because most of the other Christians they know don't go to church every Sunday. And that example means more to them than the clear command of God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The examples of others means more to us than the Word of God itself. Likewise, there's all kinds of people who never volunteer to help with the work of God's kingdom, even though God asks us to, because they're surrounded by other people who never volunteer to work for God's kingdom. Same way, there's many of us who pass by on the opposite side of a road, the poor, the hungry, the needy, and never do anything to help, even though we're called by Christ to do that. Why don't we help? Because the examples we're surrounded with mean more than the Word of God. And we even base many of our beliefs not on what God's Word tells us in the Bible, but on what the world says and thinks. And thus we question Genesis 1 and 2. We question the sacraments, whether they could really be as the Bible says. We question whether Jonah could have really been swallowed by a great fish. And maybe we can start buying some of the other lies of the world. And we start thinking that Jesus is just one way into heaven instead of the way, the way, the truth, and the life. Are we really any different, my friends, than the people who yelled out for Jesus to be crucified? I don't think so. For we too are so influenced by the crowd, by the world around us. Were we there then on that first Good Friday in that shouting crowd? Absolutely. Because it was our sins too that demanded that Jesus be crucified and put to death on his cross. By our sins too, we were yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. But even as we were yelling out for, the, for Jesus to be crucified, Jesus was yelling from his cross. He was yelling things like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. He was yelling out things like, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he was cut off from his Father for our sake. He was crying out things like, It is finished. It is accomplished. It's paid for. As we were busy going along with the crowd, Christ was busy paying for our sins, all of our sins, on that God-forsaken cross. On his cross, Jesus made payment for every single time that we went along with the world instead of faithfully following him. On his cross, Jesus truly paid for all our sins in full so that we could be forgiven. It's interesting, this is the very first time since 1945 that Ash Wednesday fell on Valentine's Day. And to me, it's almost appropriate that these two days are being celebrated together. For Jesus gave us the first and very best Valentine gift of all when he willingly went to his cross for the forgiveness of our sins. I mean, he truly showed his love for us in his Valentine gift to us when he willingly stretched out his arms and allowed them to be nailed to that cross for us. And because of his gift, his gift of himself for us, well, my friends, we are forgiven. We are restored in our relationship with God, and we're given a new opportunity to follow him and bring glory to his name. The most difficult part of being in a group is taking a stand against the group. Groupthink is such a powerful force. It's so much easier to go along with the crowd. It's so much easier to stay quiet, to not rock the boat, to let the group do the thinking for you. But Paul says in Romans, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind. In other words, we have to think for ourselves. 
We don't have to be goaded into going along with what's popular or, or convenient or safe. Christianity is really about going against the grain. It's about letting our faith define us, not our group define us, not our feelings. So often our beliefs are challenged or ignored by the crowds around us these days. And then we have to decide, are we going to remain silent and go along with the crowd once again? Do we give in to the crowd once more and let the world define us and control us? Or do we let our faith shine out as we live drastically different lives than the people of the world around us, as we live wonderfully weird lives compared to everyone else? You see, the easiest decision, the most popular decision, the safest decision isn't necessarily the Christian decision. A pastor once said that we need to let all our decisions be filtered through the God question. What is God calling me to do in this situation? What choice will bring God the most glory? And every time we choose to honor God, even if that means going against the crowd, then the reality of Christ is being made known in our world once again. And his kingdom will grow. My friends, the reality is we're all parts of many, many groups here in this world. We're surrounded constantly almost by crowds. But we do not have to fall prey to their influence. In Christ, we are set free to follow him and him alone and to let his love be seen in our lives. We do not have to be defined by the crowd, by the world, by the people around us. Instead, we can be defined by our faith and by Christ's love. May it be so among us. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.